I'm Bill Galston, a senior fellow in governance studies here at the Brookings Institution. I'd like to welcome all of you to this event and to congratulate you all on braving what in some parts of the country is record cold and pretty cold here in Washington, D.C. Uh, this event will be on the topic, The Dissatisfied Public, What Can Congress Do? And that title contains a truism and a surprise. The truism is that the American people are dissatisfied. The surprise is even the possibility that Congress could do anything about it. But we'll find out what that might be. Uh, I'm also pleased to tell the audience that we are joined by C-SPAN. Uh, so for those of you who care about such things, this will be a great time to uh, tighten your ties, adjust your hair, or do whatever else you, you, you want to do to be appealing on national television. Uh, but let me proceed to the substance. Uh, the public is dissatisfied and mistrustful. We know that, and we'll hear more about that in just a few minutes. Congress is stalemated and dysfunctional. Uh, we know that too, and we don't need a report uh, to tell us that. Uh, if the government as a whole is dysfunctional, I think by general agreement, Congress today is the epicenter of that dysfunction. Uh, Brookings owned Tom Mann was one of a team that memorably labeled Congress the broken branch. That was years ago. I think it is fair to say that it has not repaired itself in the years since. So what's the problem? If Congress is broken, why? What broke it? Uh, one answer is that rules and procedures and arrangements inside the Congress and outside uh, discourage compromise. And a lot of people busy working on rules, changes in the Congress and in the country as a whole that might address that issue. Another answer with some significant scholarly uh, backing is that Today, with an evenly divided country, there is competition for control of Congress uh, that was not so much the case in the years from the mid-1950s to the mid-1990s, and competition is, is the source of the problem. The most typical problem, answer to the question, I would say, is partisan polarization. It is the clash of two parties representing radically different visions and policy preferences. But that raises a question. Where is the partisan polarization located? Is it possible that elected officials representing their respective parties are more polarized than the people as a whole? Is that possible? Uh, and that question that I just posed is part of a larger question. Could the problem be that members of Congress are not accurately and faithfully representing the people who send them to Washington? This is the hypothesis explored by the report being released today from the Program for Public Consultation at the University of Maryland. In brief, and I don't think I'm letting too many cats out of the bag, the report concludes that the social contract between the people and their representatives has broken down, that the people see their representatives as beholden to special interests rather than the common good, and as insufficiently responsive to the views of their constituents. That is the argument that we put on the table, and you'll see evidence in favor of that proposition in just a few minutes. So what's going to happen over the next two hours to explore these issues. First, you will hear a summary of the report from the report's principal investigator. Then you'll hear reactions and analysis from noted congressional scholars and distinguished elected officials, current and former. And finally, in the last half hour or so, 
you'll have a chance to put your own questions to the authors of the report and to the panelists. But first, to continue uh, the introduction and to provide a frame, let me welcome to the podium Howard Konar, uh, a man that I've known for a while, uh, someone who is genuinely dedicated to bringing the country back together, uh, the president of an organization called Common Ground Solutions, uh, founded, I believe, in 2017, and a man whose vision and support have helped make this report possible. Howard, thank you very much for being here, and welcome. Thank you, Bill, for that introduction. I'm honored to be here today at the Brookings Institution on the same stage with scholars and elected officials who've devoted their lives to making our democracy better. I'm here to offer a perspective from outside the Beltway. I own a real estate development company in Rochester, New York, my hometown. I also manage a family foundation trying to address some of the major challenges that we face in Rochester, including high rates of child poverty and a badly failing public school system. In many ways, Rochester, Rochester is still recovering from the sharp decline of employers like Kodak, Xerox, and Bausch and & Lam. When I moved back in 1983, those three companies together employed over 80,000 people. Today, they employ less than 10,000. It's true some of their wounds were self-inflicted, but they also face challenge from changing technology and tougher global competition, and those same challenges confront our employers today. So people in Rochester, like other cities in our region and around the country, count on government, not to create jobs or solve our problems for us, but to make good and lasting policy decisions that help us build better lives for our families and our communities. And that is why it is so agonizing when elected leaders stop working together to solve problems, when they talk over and past each other without listening, or when they stop talking entirely and tweet instead, we stop making progress as a nation. We're left with a politics of anger, division, and blame. Six years ago, my daughter, my youngest, left for college, and I looked around and took stock. I believe that my children's success depends on the success and prosperity of everyone around them. As I looked out into their world, I was alarmed at the level of partisanship and hostility that was taking hold and that was starting to hold our nation back. I began spending nights and weekends studying the issues that were dividing us, and I was surprised at what I found. I read study after study with thoughtful proposals addressing the problems that we face as a nation. Health care, poverty, immigration, deficits, electoral reform, none of them being implemented, none of them being seriously discussed. In the end, I put my findings and thoughts into an essay called Common Ground, an alternative to partisan politics. I later founded Common Ground Solutions with two goals, helping people find accurate and useful information and helping them engage constructively and civilly in our political system. Common Ground Solutions began holding informal focus groups to learn more about what it would take to reach these goals. Again, what we found surprised us. We did talk to some people who expressed partisan anger and frustration, but far more often, the people we talked to said that they felt frustrated, confused, and disconnected. They get most of their news from social media, but don't trust it. They try talking to their elected representatives, but they're not sure they're listening. They badly want things to change, but feel no sense of agency. Too often they don't understand how political decisions are made and where they can begin to become active in the process. Along the way, we learned about the work of Steve Cullen, Voice of the People. We learned about their unique approach to presenting voters with policy choices and about their findings that on topic after topic, voters are often far less polarized than their representatives. Before the midterm elections last year, we hosted two policy simulations with Voice of the People. 
in two congressional districts, Cleveland and Rochester, both with open seats. We believe that Steve has developed real tools that can make a real difference in connecting citizens with their representatives. I look forward to hearing Steve speak about his research and to the discussion that follows. For me, the ultimate takeaway is a simple test. Will voters believe they have a voice and will they believe their representatives are listening? Well, thank you very much, Howard. Uh, you're an example of how concerned citizens who have the ability to focus on the real challenges before us can make a difference, and thank you. Uh, you've done half of my job of introducing Steve Cull for me, and thank you very much. Uh, you have Steve's full bio uh, in your information packets. I'm not going to run through it. Suffice it to say that both in this country and abroad, uh, Steve is widely recognized as one of the most adept practitioners, uh, not just of survey research, but of in-depth examination of how people actually react to information and argument, form judgments, both as individuals and in groups. Uh, ordinary surveys are like snapshots. They capture a moment in time. Uh, but Steve has pioneered techniques to see public opinion more dynamically uh, as a continuing response to evidence, to argument, uh, and to working, working with fellow citizens. And his, his latest work product, uh, which he will present today, uh, is, is, is one more example of what this kind of survey research technique can produce. He is uh, a senior research associate and director of the program for public consultation at the School of Public Policy, where I myself uh, used to teach. Among his many other uh, products, he co-authored with I.M. Destler, who is also in the audience today, a study entitled Misreading the Public, the myth of a new isolationism. I will hazard an educated guess that the President of the United States has not yet read that study. Uh, but I'm sure he would be deeply impressed and perhaps moved if he did. OK, Steve, uh, you know, enough, enough horsing around. Please come to the podium and share with us the results of your latest research. Thank you all for coming. And um, I'm going to try to keep myself under control here because I have so much I want to say and like to say um, on this very important topic. Uh, at the Program for Public Consultation, formerly known as uh, the Program on International Policy Attitudes, we've been studying public attitudes about democracy and governance. Uh, it's, it's really coming up on two decades now. And the, the fact that... Um, you know, the American public is uh, dissatisfied with the American government, is well known. Um, but uh, it's a problem in other countries as well. Uh, there's really no uh, democracy where the public is really satisfied. And in fact, trust in government is negatively correlated with uh, uh, Freedom House ratings in terms of uh, uh, the development of democracies. Um, and throughout the world, outside candidates uh, are being um, elected, playing on this dissatisfaction. And of course, what is a particular concern is that uh, uh, some of them are beginning to take uh, authoritarian positions, illiberal positions, and there is evidence that there is some support for the, these kinds of authoritarian positions, uh, that these are at least uh, rising. So I think it's not an overstatement to say that we really do have a crisis of democracy. Um, and um, we need, of course, to start by looking at our own situation and uh, to understand what can be done to restore the public's confidence in the democratic processes that we have. Um, 
this, you know, you kind of have this tendency to think, oh yeah, people are always cranky. The people don't like government. Sure, that's 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 natural. Well, that's not always. It's not always been the case. Back in 1964, asked how much of the time do you think you can trust the government in Washington to do what is right? Seventy-six uh, percent said just about always or most of the time. That's down now to 16 percent. That's been on a, a downward slide for for some time. Uh, ask how do you feel about the way the federal government works? A uh, large majority say that they're either either angry or dissatisfied. You can see 2016, 2018. Uh, you can see it, it gets a little better when when your party's in the White House, right? But it's still a pretty uh, even then it's a pretty large majority expressing some anger and dissatisfaction. Now I'm sure that it's, uh, this is uh, something very familiar to you, but I was literally walking to the office this morning when I uh, went, went down N Street, and there it was just hanging out there above the uh, the, the Tabard Inn, just a block a block from here. Uh, so you know my research just continues on. Um, so. Um, just to give you a quick uh, touch, you know, we've been studying this for, for many years. We've done lots of focus groups as well as surveys. In mid-2016, mid, uh, we did a survey where we had asked people with an open-ended question, you know, how do you feel about government? And, okay, what, if you're unhappy, what, what are you unhappy about? And we took lots of answers and distilled them down to 49 cre key critiques. Um, and uh, with a separate sample, but then and more recently asked how much they agreed with each one. So as we go along, you'll see these critiques that, again, have sort of popped out spontaneously uh, uh, from people. Uh, we've done a lot of surveys in the last two years working on this, uh, this question. Uh, with a total of over 16,000 registered voters, with the, you can see all the various margins of error there. And they were all conducted online uh, with a sample pr provided by uh, uh, Nielsen Scarborough, a representative of whom is here today. Thanks for coming, Neil. Um, and uh, they're drawn from their larger probability-based uh, panel recruited by telephone and mail. So what's my kind of key conclusion, as Bill already uh, indicated a bit? My fundamental conclusion is that people feel that there has been a violation of, the found, of a social contract that goes back to the founders. And this contract goes something like this. In exchange for the people giving elected officials the reins of power, submitting to that power and paying taxes, that elected officials should serve the common good of the people rather than their own interests or any type of special interest or partisan interest. And they should consult and be influenced by the views of the people they represent. Let me give you a few quick, quick, quick examples. Uh, from uh, John Adams, government is instituted for the common good, for the protection, safety, prosperity, and happiness of the people, and not for the profit, honor, or private uh, interests of any one man family. And we have a little problem here of it's falling off the screen. Um, Alexander Hamilton said a government ought to be free from every other control but a regard to the public good and to the sense of the people. There they both are, regard uh, to the public good and the sense of the people. And we asked people uh, in, in a, a survey, imagine the founders of the American Republic were somehow able to observe how the U.S. government is operating today. In your opinion, would the founders think that the U.S. government is fulfilling the vision they had very well, somewhat well, not that well, not well at all, and so on? And 85% said, not that well, or not well at all. Uh, Democrats were m more negative than Republicans, but it's all pretty up there. So, core principle, failing to serve the common good over special interests. Well, there's this question that uh, has been asked now for quite a few years. Would you say the government is pretty much run by a few big interests looking out for themselves, or that it is run for the benefit of all the people? Well, you can see that climbing line there is though, are those who say that it's run for a few big interests looking out for themselves, and the sliding downward line is for the benefit of all the people. Spontaneously, people say things like, Congress does not serve the good of the people, and overwhelming majorities of all parties agree with that argument. Organized interests and their lobbyists have too much influence overwhelming agreement. Corporations and their lobbyists have too much influence. 
overwhelming agreement. You think Republicans and Democrats don't agree on anything these days? There is a lot they agree on. Rich people have too much influence. Well, the Republicans go down on that a little bit, but it's still three quarters and overall very large majority. Now, the primary mechanism of influence is seen as campaign donations. We ask, how often do you think members of Congress put a higher priority on serving the interests of organizations and individuals who have donated money to their ele election rather than serving the good of the country? And 84% uh, say often or almost always. 50% almost always. And again, very bipartisan. Elected officials are seen as overly responsive to partisan interests. Members of Congress think mostly about their party, not what is a good for the country. Again, that's the core of the violation. It's not that it's bad to do something good for your party, but they're not thinking about what's good for the country, and that is the, the violation of that uh, uh, social contract. Uh, political parties are too beholden to special interests. These two things are actually very connected because competing special interests influence different parties. And so the parties fight, but behind it are these special interests uh, that uh, are extracting commitments from, uh, from uh, elected officials. And that's how it's perceived. They're basically people that, uh, that special interests buy the influence over uh, elected officials. And because they're, they're, they're polarized, those, those interests, then intrinsically uh, the uh, uh, elected officials are, are, uh, and parties are, are polarized. There's too much partisanship in government. Well, we tried a different approach. We said, well, when different political parties compete for influence in a democracy, which do you think most, op most often happens? The competition of ideas creates a vibrant system where many voices are heard, leading to decisions that best reflect the will of the people. Right? That, that, you, you could think that. Or the pi parties fight for their narrow interests, the will of the people is ignored, and the results do not serve the people. And, well, came out pretty clearly on one side. So the next component of this uh, violated uh, contract is that Elected officials fail to consult and be influenced by the people. So I've been assumed incorrectly that the founders had this idea that you shouldn't. Uh, you know, they almost people almost think they're Burkeans or something. That they don't that they shouldn't pay attention to the public. That really doesn't hold up. Um, Alexander Hamilton, who is one of the people who's often attributed with this view, wrote, it is, not nat is it not natural that a man who is candidate for the favor of the people should take care to inform himself of their dispositions and inclinations and should be willing to allow them their proper deg degree of influence over their conduct? Um, oh, there you go. Um, and James Ma Madison said, it is the reason alone of the public that ought to control and regulate government, a very strong statement, and that Congress should have an intimate sympathy with the, the, with the we lost a word there with the people, um, the formatting issues when we crossed, uh, crossed uh, two systems here. And um, uh, Thomas Jefferson said, said, every government Je degenerates when trust, trusted to the rulers of the people alone. The people themselves, therefore, are its only safe depository. If once they become inattentive to the public affairs, you and I, and I have to tell you what the rest of us, will all become wolves. So, in the spontaneous critiques, overwhelming majority say members of Congress do not listen to the people they represent. Uh, overwhelming well, I mean, majority say Congress does not do what the majority of the people would do. And when asked how often do elected officials make the same decisions that the majority of Americans would make, the mean estimate was a third of the time. Less than chance. Repub Republicans, 39%, Democrats, 30%, very common theme. There's a, we could have a whole discussion too about how much um, there is a consonance between what government does, but there's a lot of data out there to support the notion that there are serious discrepancies between public opinion and what con Congress uh, and the federal government in general does. 
As how responsive do you think members of Congress should be to the views of the majority of their constituents on a zero to 10 scale? Uh, the mean response is 8.4, not 10. Not, we're not talking about direct democracy here, but pretty high, 8.4. And how much, how responsive are they? On average, 3.7. Uh, four among Republicans, three and a half Dems. And the numbers who said that the influence should be greater than it is, is 88 to 90 percent. There's a substantial optimism that with greater responsiveness, there will be positive effects. Uh, it's as, asked if the views of the public were to have more influence, do you think the nation would be better off or worse off than it is today? Overwhelmingly, they say better off. And here again, we tried inserting an argument saying, when Congress gets stuck in gridlock, do you think if Congress would listen to the views of the people, this would help break the log jam because the people are less polarized than Congress? Or turning to the views of the people would not help because the gridlock in Congress is just a reflection of the polarization among the people. And um, clearly they go for the first formulation that uh, if Congress would listen to the people more, this would help break the log jam. Now, there's a very strong relationship between perceptions of responsiveness and voting. Uh, we ask people to rate their incumbent senator in terms of responsiveness on a 0 to 10 scale, and then we ask whether they voted for that uh, incumbent senator, and there was a very high correlation for a social scientist where you go, wow, this is, this is, this is nice stuff. Um, well, not necessarily, but... Um, so, as you can see, the higher the perception of um, responsiveness. Over there on the left, you have a very low perception of responsiveness rising more as it, come, as it goes to the right here. So by the time you're you know, above six, they're voting for the most of the time. Um, but <coughs> even at five, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's un un doubtful. Uh, we also asked uh, people to say, uh, this was just after the election uh, in 2016, we said, how responsive do you think Donald Trump will be or how Hillary Clinton would have been? And then we looked at their voting, and again, very high correlation between those two factors. Now, this narrative of violating the social contract comes a lot from outsider candidates, and it played a significant role in the 2016 and 2018 elections. Um, oh, geez. Uh, we have a little problem here. Um, Donald Trump, we are fighting for every American who believes government should serve the people, not the donors, and not the special interests. The government will work for the people, and what's underneath there is uh, the people will be in charge. Not just they'll have influence, they will be in charge. Um, Bernie Sanders, another outsider candidate. The struggle of the people to create a government which represents all of us and not just the 1%, I look forward to being part of that struggle. And uh, AOC, I'm fine being called a bull in a china shop because, the, because politics that answers the special interests more than the American people should be disrupted. So this is clearly a, a narrative that people respond to on the left and the right, particularly when you're talking about candidates that are outsider candidates and have they succeed in, in uh, uh, pushing aside um, more establishment candidates. All right, what can be done? Well, the, one of the most common uh, proposals is to have structural reforms to counter the power of special interests, campaign donors, and incumbent uh, political parties, and we have done some in-depth uh, or in-depth surveys on this uh, on these proposals, and most of them get rather robust support. Uh, ones that limit the influence of campaign donors through campaign finance reforms, very large support for constitutional amendment enabling governments to put limits on campaign spending, bipartisan. A uh, large majority sort, uh, support various efforts to offset the influence of big campaign donors by promoting more donation, donations by small donors and uh, uh, increasing requirements for public disclosure of campaign contributions. This is all available online. Um, they are very, very strong bipartisan support for limiting lobbying by extending the period former elected officials or staffers must wait for before becoming a lobbyist. Uh, and to uh, 
counter the power of the incumbent party. They favor having citizen commissions design congressional districts to, to counter gerrymandering. Uh, term limits for members of Congress, again, that's a bipartisan one, and making it more possible for independent candidates to succeed in a whole variety of ways. Now, on consulting the people. Well, we've been developing, there are a lot of different methods for uh, consulting the people. There's a lot of experimentation that's going on out there, and all of it is uh, very useful, and, and we're all learning a lot from each other. We have been focusing particularly on a, on a method called the citizen cabinet. And a citizen cabinet is a large representative sample of a district, state, or a nation that's uh, been pulled together to be consulted on issues before government. And they go through an online process called a policy-making simulation. And this includes, includes a briefing on an issue and, and the policy options that are in play. They evaluate very strongly stated pro and con arguments, the ones that are being made in the current discourse. And then finally, they make recommendations. Sometimes they're, they're required to deal with trade-offs, like when they're making up a budget, they, they see the effect of their choices on a deficit and so on. All of the content is reviewed by experts across the spectrum of views, um, uh, of, most often congressional staffers, sometimes from our advocacy groups, or, or both. And ultimately, the, the results are aggregated, weighted, and so on, and delivered to congressional representatives and to the media. It's all publicly disclosed, and, and we put the, the, the policymaking simulation online. You can do it yourself, and in the end, send your recommendations to your members as well. Well, so we describe uh, how would you feel about a member who would say, okay, I, I'm, I want to invite you, constituents, to become part of a citizen cabinet, to give me this kind of input. I'm going to take it into account. Uh, I want to hear from you. And how do people feel about that? Well, oh, 90% say they approve. Okay. You know, right out of the park. Um, so, um, and, and, and how likely do you think it would be if a member had such a citizen cab cabinet, they would be more responsive? Well, not quite as high, but about two-thirds say, yeah, very somewhat likely. But is it politically viable for members or candidates to promote having a citizen cabinet? So to uh, find out you know, how a, a, a political consultant would react, we, we talked to some, one in particular, and said, you know, what, what would need to, what, what, what would make you think it would be a good idea for a candidate to actually propose something like this? And we got a few, you know, challenges, and one of them was a question, well, will partisanship override po the positive response to having a citizen cabinet? And you just said, okay, here's this nice person who says they want to do this. But what if you put a partisan label on them, right? So it's, it's really, you know, it's, this is a Republican doing it or this is a Democrat doing it. So we had, a, 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 with a very elaborate survey, the, the, we had a candidate who, who, who's presented who makes a pledge to consult constituents, support having a citizen cabinet, and, the, that, and pledges to take into account, not do, but take into account its recommendations when deciding how to vote. And the candidate was given a partisan label and, and presented to different subsamples. Well, what is particularly interesting to me is what the effect of the of the uh, uh, la partisan label opposed to the own the, the 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 party of the respondent. So here we have the Republican view of a Democratic candidate who would do this. Well, seventy nine percent say that they would have a positive view of that. And 64% said that it would make them more likely to vote for them, and about 20% of said said much more likely to vote for them. Um, you know, kind of thing that's uh, you know, so that even with that partisanship, the, the the desire for this responsiveness was strong enough to to really have this positive response. On the Democratic view of the Republican candidate, 92% were positive, even higher, and 80% said that they would be more likely to vote for this Republican candidate who made this pledge. Well, okay, but in the rough and tumble of a campaign, will a candidate who supports having a citizen cabinet be vulnerable to attacks? One person said, this is a very target-rich idea, and rolled out a bunch of possible attacks, and I won't be able to show them all to you, because, but, 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 but they're in the report. Here's an example. Members of Congress shouldn't govern by putting their finger to the wind. Oh, I'm sorry. So we had another sample, and we said, okay, there is a debate. 
And there are people, you know, there's one person who's saying I'm they're, they're for a citizen cabinet, and we, we give them, a, you know, um, a partisan label has made this commitment and so on. And there's a challenger. Okay, here's what the challenger says against this candidate. Members of Congress shouldn't govern by putting their finger to the wind, reacting to every shift in public opinion. The American people elect members of Congress to show leadership and make decisions. Having a citizen cabinet would make it harder for members of Congress to exercise their independent judgment, make the hard decisions, and do what is best for the country rather than what they think is popular. So there was a strong assumption among this, in these consultants that this would really draw blood. Um, but it really did not do well. Only 35% found it somewhat or very convincing. Then there was the, the rebuttal. The problem with Congress is not that they're too reactive to public opinion, it's that they're too reactive to special interests. The citizen cabinet will give me advice from people who have heard all sides of an issue and come to well-considered conclusions that accurate, accurately reflect the will of the people. This way we can all be sure that the special interests are not in charge. I think that when the people have accurate and balanced information, they can give valuable advice about what is best for the country. Well, this one knocks it out of the chart, out of, out of the park. 84% finding it convincing. Now, then we, after they went through four of these, then we said, okay, based on what you have heard in this debate, who would you be more inclined to vote for? Not just see, do you like them? Who would you be more inclined to vote for? And the question we wanted to know is, would people cross party lines and say that they would, you know, a Republican would vote for a Democrat, a Democrat would vote for a Republican based on what they heard here? Now, obviously, in a real one uh, election, there would be more factors, but just based on this, could they actually say that, that they would cross party lines? And 78% of Republicans said that they would cross party lines and vote for a Democrat, uh, Democratic candidate who commits to consult the citizen cabinet. And 90% of Democrats said that they would cross party lines and vote for a Republican. What that says to me is that concern about responsiveness is a stronger force, a bigger factor than partisanship. Well, last, will the citizen cabinet really find common ground? I mean, it sounds nice. They seem like nice people, but really in the end, will they? Will they do any better at solving the problems that have, sol that have stymied Congress? Well, we've done a big pilot study. You can get more summaries in the report. I'm just going to touch on a few quick ones before I close. Um, and with a, a large national uh, a citizen cabinet with uh, Nielsen Scarborough. And we did it in eight states and two districts. And I'm just going to give you a quick taste of some of the things that we found on Social Security. Uh, we had them explain the Social Security shortfall problem. And we said, okay, here are these different options. And they're each one scored in terms of how, what impact they had on the shortfall. And they could make their own recommendations. And, um, and as they went along, a little bubble told them how they were doing relative to the shortfall. What happened in the end was basically a very large majority of Republicans and Democrats agreed on steps that eliminated two-thirds of the shortfall. Remember, the, this is the third rail. Nobody can get near this. Nobody wants to deal with reality. Um, but uh, by reducing benefits for the upper 25 percent, raising the retirement age to 68, raising the cap on taxable earnings to 215,000 or more, uh, or raising the payroll tax from 6.2 to 6.6 percent. So you can see more than 70 percent of both Republicans and Democrats agreed on that, and that uh, covered 66 percent. Furthermore, another 59 percent uh, went further and eliminated the cap, and also 58 percent raised minimum monthly benefits, which actually uh, worsened the, the, the shortfall. But altogether, with all those proposals, you cover 98 percent of the shortfall. Again, this is the problem that is seen as impossible to solve because it's the third rail and because people don't understand, you know, they're just babies, they want their benefits, they don't want to pay for it, you've heard all that. Federal budget, this is another one where you, there are polls that show majority say, yes, we should cut the deficit. A majority say, you, but then you ask them, do you want to raise your taxes? No, rather not. Do you want to cut education? Do you want to cut transportation? Do you want to cut this or this? Or? No, not ra really. Rather not. Rather not. You see, the public is just a big baby. They just don't understand money in, money out. Well, 
when what we have done is we give them the federal budget, discretionary budget bro broken into 31 line items. Here's how much goes to each. Here are the sources of revenue. Here are the tax rates. Here are new options, all of them scored. And you now can make up your own budget, make, however you like. And as you go along, there's this little bubble that tells you how you're doing relative to the deficit. You give people that situation, they actually do reduce the deficit. The overall majority reduced it by $348 billion the last time we did it. Now, and now there were differences between Republicans and Democrats, but they did converge on $128 billion in deficit reductions, and everybody acted out of character. The Republicans raised taxes, and the Democrats cut spending. Um, yes, yeah, right. Um, now, immigration, another thing, oh my God, there's, there's nothing we can do about that. I mean, it's, it's hopeless. Um, and it's true that this issue of the wall on the southern border is very polarizing. A majority oppose it, but a majority of Republicans favor it, and an overwhelming majority of Democrats oppose it. So yeah, okay, this is, this is, this is a tough one. Does that mean there's, is there no low-hanging fruit? Is there nothing they can agree on? Well, it turns out that there were a few things that they agreed on. One was a pro Republican proposal to require employers to use the E-Verify system. It's modeled after a Republican uh, bill. And here you have very large majority, 72% overall, 83% of Repu Republicans, 60% of, of Democrats agreeing. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Here's another one. Expand the program for guest workers. Once again, large majorities agreeing. Yeah, that's a good plan. On DACA, provide legal status and make uh, them eligible for citizenship in 10 to 12 years. Large bipartisan majorities. So it is, there is low-hanging fruit. But I think basically the political system doesn't reinforce people going for the low-hanging fruit. They're, they, they're, it reinforces going after things that are polarizing because that makes you more distinctive. But in fact, if you give the, the, the public voice and the means, they will point the way. And I'm going to just end with a, a quote from uh, Thomas Jefferson. The ultimate arbiter is the people. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.